Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Matt Skinner. And me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Caroline Lewis. It is Christmas Eve, December 24th, 2023. And the texts for Nativity of Our Lord are Isaiah 9, 2 through 7, Psalm 96, Titus 2, 11 through 14, and Luke 2, 1 through 14, or you can add verses 15 through 20. So just a few hours ago, it shifted from being Advent 4 in the morning to now all of a sudden it's time for the Christmas evening service. And these are our texts. So we have a separate podcast for Advent 4. We have a separate podcast for one of the settings for Nativity for Christmas Day as well, which actually will resume Luke chapter 2. So if you're planning to preach on Luke chapter 2 anytime during this span of days, uh, there's two podcasts that will be useful to you. And we're going to focus mostly on the first 14 verses in this podcast. That's a lot of information. It's also still Caroline's birthday on the 24th, whether it's morning or evening, apparently. Until uh, midnight. Day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Down the door. Right. Yeah. So still my birthday. Happy birthday to me. Yeah. Yay. 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 We're grateful. We're grateful. <laughs> Thank you. So, of course, the challenge and the beauty of, of Christmas preaching is people tend to be familiar with at least the gospel text that you're reading. And uh, so we've got Luke in front of us, which everybody knows from a Charlie Brown Christmas Carol, a Christmas special. I might be dating myself, but you all can relate to that. A little bit, but I can relate. <laughs> so, yeah. I, so we don't need to go into too much depth of the breadth of the text, but is there a place you would maybe settle in and drill down this year? Is there a, a, a detail of the story or a theme or a, a something, a hook that catches your attention? Yeah, that's something that we often will do for Christmas because there's so much, the story tells itself, that's the thing uh, in that. And typically often preachers and worship planners will plan a kind of service around the reading of the text itself. And I think that that's, I think that's really important because as I was experiencing this text again this year, one thing that's so uh, remarkable yet unremarkable, <laughs> you could easily pass over it, is, is just the narrative details itself. And so to invite people into the fact that it's not that, and Jesus was born, here are all these details and what do these details mean? And you, you are almost in almost in real time listening to it. And so then paying attention to the details makes a difference. And where where I would invite our preachers, where are you landing? Where what detail is is grabbing you this year? For me this year it was this will be a sign for you. Mm. And I think it because I mean and then what comes is like the not expected. <laughs> I mean, we expect it because we've been doing this for forever and ever and ever, you know, and, and Jesus laying in a manger and, and, and it wrapped in bands of cloth, you will find a child. But if you kind of like pause at that colon and say, is that what anybody expected? And this will be a sign for you, colon there, you know, you will find a child and um, I, that's kind of where I was landing is what would you, what, what would follow? I mean, we know we, we were expecting this, but what is it about this? What's the sign, the child, the bands of cloth lying in a manger? What is the sign pointing to? How would you end that colon <laughs> of the promises of Christmas? What's the sign of Christmas that you uh, that you know Christmas is here that that Jesus has come? So I play around with that a little bit this year, homiletically, and just kind of see see where that would take me. I love that, Caroline. It's particularly appropriate coming out of the season of Advent of expectation. It actually makes that bridge into the reality very. Um, uh, it ties it up very neatly, I, I think. Uh, I, I appreciate that. Um, what struck for me, and um, uh, some of this is uh, having um, uh, the last few months spent uh, some time in the Psalms, is how many 
the familiarity indeed of this occasion and people gathering uh, for uh, with family and friends, uh, uh, many coming from afar. Uh, and the stories that we tell when we gather with folks we know that kind of form us back into community. We laugh at the things that uh, were funny. We pause uh, because of those who aren't present anymore. And those kinds of rehearsals are often done in familiar songs for us. Uh, the Psalms and the songs. And uh, so um, the verse that, uh, that catches my attention is um, the, uh, um, the, the reminder that, that says to us, um, I'm bringing you good news. And then skipping down and suddenly there was an angel in the multitude of the heavens praising God. And right now, we need good news. Right now, everything around us is hungering. And the songs we might be singing are more lament. But when we gather with family and friends, we tell those familiar stories. So here we are on Sunday morning or Sunday evening, and we get to tell a familiar story. What if we did the story in song? Uh, I know some people do this for an Easter vigil. What if we did a Christmas Eve service where the song told the story that people who don't know the story, uh, Caroline, you kept saying, folks, you know, we're so familiar with it. One of the things that uh, I'm uh, recognizing is how many people don't know the story. And so how to get that story in through the songs in a way that would have the response be, this is good news. So the, the, the creativity is choosing the songs in a way where they build to tell the story and then um, singing it in a robust way where people have to pay attention to the words and then prayerfully uh, moving toward a congregation that says, this is a good story. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, song 96, song 96 oh. will help you out with that joy with the... Absolutely. If you read the commentary from Rolf that the focus on singing and all of nature and creation singing and mm -hmm. so, it took me so long to lead into that. I didn't say that. Thank you, Matt. Yeah, yeah. That, would be, that would be a great connection to um, what you were saying, Joy. I mean, so that could be a way to bring in bring in the psalm if that was a, a direction that you took homiletically. So Absolutely. that's yeah, yeah, that's great. How about you, Matt? For me this year, it's uh, verse six. And while they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child. Uh, the, the Greek there technically is the days were fulfilled. But I like that expression that's in the NRSV and also there in the NRSV updated edition. When, you know, the time came, which for me is, you know, time and apocalyptic and all of that is, you know, it's, those are big themes in any gospel, but for Christmas Eve, I would say there's something about this that suggests this is out of anybody's control. This is out of any human being's control. Mary doesn't decide when to go into labor. And so people sometimes fuss about why did nobody make any room for them if there's this pregnant woman there? Maybe she's, maybe she's giving birth to a premature child, you know, maybe who knows what's going on because you don't have control over that. And so when the time comes, and so it's this reminder of intrusion, of Christmas as this intrusion, but it's also a reminder that I think in our own lives, we often feel kind of as if we're victims, or at least these passive recipients of history. We don't get to choose when certain things happen. They just happen. And sometimes that's incredibly inconvenient. Sometimes that's just in the nick of time and helpful. Uh, you know, Christmas as well. It just happens if you're not ready for it <laughs> too late. Christmas is coming anyway. So, you know, uh, you know, whether it's the food's not perfect or the last gift hasn't been bought, you know, there's just something about when the time is fulfilled, you do what has to be done. And for Mary, that's give birth. Uh, for the rest of us, that's, you know, worship, that's welcome. Sometimes it means get to work. Sometimes it means mourn. You know, it's just this, this way in which part of Christmas is a surrender 
maybe surrender is the wrong word, kind of a giving over of control to God and recognizing God's influence in our lives for the, for the better. <laughs> yeah, that's really, yeah, I really like that, Matt, too. Um, and it just, all of a sudden I went, I went to all these different places with that, uh, that the time came and how, yeah, how do, how do we surrender to that and how much we, how much we want to control time or control the events of our lives. And I think uh, when you said, you know, it could be a premature child, I'm like, oh my goodness, that both of my boys were, you know, I hadn't even been to birth classes yet. And for my first one, and I, uh, and he was nine weeks early and the time came and or there you, and I had a baby 12 hours later. And so, um, and then, but then I've also been thinking quite a bit about uh, this particular year about my dad. And I think last year I was just numb still with grief, you know, and you're just going through sort of the motions of the holidays and you, you know, you just, you're just numb. And then this year there, I feel them a lot more. And so I think that would be a meaningful too. Uh, Christmas brings up a lot. It's, it's, it's this good news, right? But it's, it brings up a lot of emotions and a lot of memories and, uh, and, and the traditions and, and loved ones that we've lost. And so I, that could be, a, I think, a really pastoral move, Matt, of sitting in the time came and there's just not a whole lot you can do about that. The time came for my dad to die. I couldn't control that. The time came for my son to be born. Both of my sons, I couldn't control that. Uh, and, and, but how, how do we, though, surrender into, what does it feel like to just kind of let go of that and say, God is in control or God, God, we're in God's, we're in God's time and, and let that be maybe a little bit of a balm for people to experience that. I love the fact that you said that, uh, we can't even control whether or not the meal is going to be perfected. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you put you, in my kitchen or something. No, but if you're there on the night of the 24th and you're stressed out about stuff, like um, it's too late. Just ha yeah. this is the Christmas you've got. And so how are you going to, and maybe relinquish is a better word than surrender. I'm not sure I like introducing the word surrender into that, but you know, yeah. you know what I mean? I um, mean, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I know what you mean. Uh, if we go off of, off the, Luke text, and we might come back to it too. I mean, that's so much of what Christmas is, is kind of weaving in and out of, out of these texts. But I really appreciated the commentary on Isaiah chapter mm. nine um, and uh, Thea's commentary, particularly around the titles of, of, that are given of for Jesus or, mm -hmm. or you know, for the child. No. And that would be maybe another direction I would go uh, that to dwell even just on one or a number of them to say, what does it mean to call Jesus wonderful count to call this baby in the manger, uh, wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. And for me, I, you know, the direction that I suggested or that was, that, that was attractive to me about a sign, where do we see the signs of wonderful counselor? Where do we see the signs of a mighty God? Where do we see the signs of everlasting father or prince of peace? So I would kind of tie that in somehow, but uh, the, they're such remarkable titles, uh, and they're so full. They're so deep, and each one could be a sermon on their own. So that or, or or a song, or a song. Yes, <laughs> that that could that could be the playlist. Those titles, many of them have been, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, written into song, and that could that could be the playlist. So that's the, what I was thinking about with the Isaiah text. Yeah. Kind of connecting and, to Luke and, or. and and since we've already mentioned uh, the song, um, how about if we considered uh, the Titus as as a kind of uh, a benediction or or some prayer uh, throughout? Uh, it would it would uh, uh, enable uh, the inclusion of it with a note of um, 
of just how this is um, recorded in the um, commentary, um, the message of the incarnation that we celebrate. Mm -hmm. uh, and to, to use that, <clears throat> excuse me, to use that as a benediction, um, maybe by just highlighting that point for folks to realize there is this, this letter um, that points to why we tell these stories. I like that, the idea of how do we keep the Titus passage somewhat And prominent. then anything, any more on, on Titus or? I chose to go in that, in that way because it, it seems like um, we were uh, struggling over surrender, um, relinquish. Um, I think, I can't remember the word I thought of before you brought in uh, relinquish, but um, Titus is a reminder for us in the moment that we are living um, to relinquish the things that are our passions in the world and to, um, um, to I, I, I forgot the word that I said now because I liked relinquish and I think the other word would, would finish my sentence because what I want to say now is surrender to the moment that Jesus uh, has intruded into our uh, existence, a moment that is a moment where we need it, whether we're grieving um, or whether we're just anxious about what's going on in the world. Now, that's the reality that these letters were written to or into. And um, we do need to pause and celebrate. We do need to tell this Christmas story. We do need to gather with one another in a joyous occasion. Um, but knowing that some of the things that are all around us might have to be um, relinquished also in order for us to appreciate what you call the intrusion. I love that, Matt. Um, thanks. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, and I like what you said about making sure that Titus gets some attention, whether that's in a sermon or as a kind of benediction or however you choose to use it liturgically or in the reading. Because one of the one of the things about Christmas preaching, I think, is it's easy to become sentimental or romantic, where it's just about, you know, the birth of a baby in troubled times, which of course it is. And of course, that's a sign of hope. Um, it's easy to just kind of make it that kind of a sermon. But with Titus here, you've also got this connection to the whole world, bringing salvation to all. You know, it telescopes Christmas from this obscure birth to this woman who probably is not widely known except in her village and to her family. And then all of a sudden this idea of salvation coming uh, to all this universal scope that Titus imagines is a reminder of just how intrusive maybe, or just how significant it is that this new time has come. This moment has come. Well, and I think too, connected to that, that it, what Titus does is, I, I, that's really helpful, Matt, is just widens the scope <laughs> uh, that, that, and sort of the, kind of the, I, I don't know, I don't even know if the awesomeness, if you will, of the fact that in Jesus is what, what Titus gives us words for, the grace of God, salvation to all, blessed hope, manifestation of glory, redemption, <laughs> that that's, that's what you're, that's what we're seeing in, in this baby in a manger. And so helping people or imagining that this is, you know, this is what the grace of God looks like. This is what the glory of God looks like. This is what salvation looks like. And, and particularly connected to the fact that, 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 that and there, I think another thing is going back to your intrusion metaphor, uh, Matt. Is that yeah that the grace of God, the grace of God intrudes, salvation intrudes, redemption intrudes, in the least expected ways and in times that we might never expect. And that's uh, that's something about the promise of Christmas as well. Yeah, we should say one last thing, which is. Uh, at any time in the season, we could say this, but people are preaching a lot during these weeks and people are adding some cases, funerals and memorial services in as well. And we just want to say thank you to our listeners 
wish all of you a very, very Merry Christmas and tell you that we see you. (laughs) We see the sermons you're preparing. Yeah. Yeah. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas.